this morning we're so excited, and I'm always excited when we come together, but today's a special day. Uh, we have some of our missionaries, North Texas District missionaries who are with us. In fact, these missionaries are special. Uh, his father has served as basically the superintendent for Mexico and also grew up with one of our own, with Moses Duran. Both, his, their, both their fathers served in the, the Mexico office, but then also on top of that, they grew up with each other. And so we're going to have to give Moses a hard time. He's out of town this morning. So that means you got freedom to tell any great stories that you want to tell this morning. And he's not here to back it up or not, so you can really evangelistically speak if you want to on his behalf. But otherwise, this morning, would y'all do me a big favor as we welcome the De Los Reyes family, Danny and his wife, Kayla, and their daughters, as they come to share the word this morning. Amen. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Uh, thank you, Pastor Nathan and Casey, for allowing us to be here, opening the door to visit with you today, to speak today. And uh, we just want to we just want to say thank you for, for having us here. We're Danny and Kayla de los Reyes, and with our daughters, Malia, Olivia, who are here. Naomi is in Harvest Time Kids uh, service, enjoying herself this morning. And over the last decade, we've been in ministry at uh, North Place Church in, in the area of Saxe, and... Uh, we have now a new assignment to go to Mexico City as missionaries, and we're going to be planting churches for the for the people that are disenfranchised and uh, urban in the urban settings. There's a lot of atheism that has crept up, and so our call has been one of obedience and surrender to the call of life in our lives. Yes, yeah, so I grew up in Washington State, very far north near the Canadian border. And it was a very rural, very secluded um, upbringing. And I met Jesus when I was six years old um, at a feeding program in a city park. And there was a clown there presenting the gospel. And a clown led me to Jesus that day. And so I am a product of community outreach uh, by a local church. And that's why we believe in the local church, the ministry of the local church. And we have devoted our entire lives to serving the church and discipling believers. And so I, at 18, um, went to Mexico for a two-year missions term as a college student, and I fell in love with missions, fell in love with Mexico, the culture, the people, and um, came back, and, and I fell in love with him. So <laughs> we, we finished college, got married, and have been serving in ministry here in Texas ever since, and now the Lord is calling us back to Mexico. And for myself, as as Pastor Nathan was saying, my I grew up in a in a pastor's home. My dad was a pastor. My grandfather was a pastor. So I've been in ministry basically since you know uh, since before I was even born. I've been in in, in a church in a church uh, church environment. So uh, we have been there, and uh, actually have some. If you if you understand me a little bit, I'm from Mexico, so you might, I might have a little bit of an accent, of a thick accent. So I apologize for that this morning. But I just I just came to the U.S. as a first uh, as a first uh, generation American to come and pursue the American dream, and the Lord opened doors to be able to do that. Uh, I did what everybody tells you to do: get your papers right, become a citizen of this country, and and did that. And the Lord opened up amazing opportunities. Uh, we had success doing what we were doing. We had security doing what we were doing. However, over the past year, we've been increasingly feeling the Lord tugging our hearts to a different plan uh, for ourselves. So, so that's what we're doing. We're, as a family, we are, we're packing up our house. This week has been one of packing up our house and getting ready to sell it. Uh, we, we are basically giving away our belongings, giving away uh, everything that we've owned for the last uh, 13 years of marriage. And for a lot of people, it might sound impractical because you've come here to the land of amazing opportunities and the Lord's calling you to go back. But we know that when you, when you follow God, he leads to amazing opportunities. And so that's what we're doing. We're following God 
to the opportunities that he has for us. And we know that the local church is God's avenue to change Mexico City. And we've chosen, like as Kayla said, we've chosen uh, to give of our lives to, to advance what the Lord advances, which is the local church. And so during our first twar- uh, d- uh, term, we'll be planting a church and partnering with other missionaries in, in the city to reach people that are far away from Jesus. Yeah, so Mexico City is one of the largest cities in the world. There's 26 million people who live there. And of those 26 million people, less than 4% of them know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So the need is absolutely huge. And within the city of 26 million people, there are 37 churches in our fellowship. And so we know that if there's a healthy, thriving, spirit-filled church in every neighborhood, we will be able to reach 26 million people one by one. And so we have chosen as a family to um, love what the Lord loves and invest in what the Lord invests in. And we are, our goal is to not only plant a church, but to be a, pl- a church that plants more churches and to multiply. And so as we go into this next endeavor in our lives, we realize that it takes three different kinds of people to make this a reality. And the first person is God. He's the one that called us into this endeavor. The second person is our family as we answer God's call to go and serve the people of Mexico. And the third is you. Your partnership makes it possible for our work to reach people far from God in in Mexico City. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. So you might be sitting there today saying, well, how can I help? Well, the very first thing that we ask is that you pray for our family. And as you're leaving today, we have a a table outside and we have prayer cards. And my kids would love to pass them out to you. It's their favorite thing to do on Sundays is hand out our cards. And we just ask that you put it in your Bible or put it on your fridge. And when you see it, just lift us up in prayer for the safety of our family. And not only that, but that the people in Mexico would be ready to receive the gospel. And the second thing you can do is partner with us. We need monthly partners who will support us financially, um, support our ministry as we go into Mexico City. And we're really close to being fully funded. We just need some more people to join our team. So if the Lord puts that on your heart today, we would love to talk to you and walk you through that process. And the third thing is to join us. Maybe at some point you would love to come down to Mexico City, bring a missions team. Um, We would love to have you, and you're always welcome to serve with us. Thank you. And so thank you for having us here today. As, as Pastor Nathan was mentioning, I grew up with Moses, who is one of the, uh, he's on the board of elders at, at this church. I realized that. So I have a lot of great stories, but I won't go into all of that because he's not here to defend himself. Uh, but I do have some great stories, just so you know. Uh, I'm, a, I'm the oldest of three, and so I had a little brother that was the same age as him and his, and his brother Zach. So the three of them would get into trouble, and I would be the older brother trying to help him out, you know, trying to help him not get into so much trouble. And, uh, but we've heard some great things about harvest time. Uh, when, I, when I came to the, to, to the U.S. to go to school in, in, at Sagu, uh, one of my very good friends was uh, Jordan McKnight. His dad used to be pastor here uh, many years ago. And so we've heard some great testimonies of the, of the work that the Lord has done in this community. And in fact, I have another story that I would like to share to you towards the end of the message. Uh, but today, I would love to talk to you, to continue talking about the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Today, I would like to add to the conversation that you've been on for the last few weeks about the person of the Holy Spirit. What is his role in our daily lives? And what does that look like? Uh, why do we need the Holy Spirit in our daily lives? And somebody might have asked, well, do we need the Holy Spirit to go to, Wal- uh, to, go to, to go to heaven? And to that, I would answer, we need the Holy Spirit to go to Walmart. We need the Holy Spirit just to cross the street, to drive on 35. Come on, somebody. You need the guidance of the Spirit to just go about your daily routine. And so it's very important. And so my heart today is not to have a dogmatic uh, or argumentative uh, preaching, but more of an honest conversation during which I would love to talk to you about who the person of the Holy Spirit is and what does he do. And so my hope is that I would bring a little bit of a fresh insight to you about who the Holy Spirit is and the invitation that we have of the Holy Spirit to, to join in the journey to experience 
his power and what does that power do in our lives. Ephesians 2.22 says, And in him you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. God lives by his spirit. The key word here is by his spirit. You, us, we, everybody in here, we are dwe- we're a dwelling place for the glory of the Holy Spirit on earth. And, but the, one of the difficult things that we see is that there is a, a body that is divided sometimes in what the Holy Spirit does. There's a difficult thing, it's a difficult thing to talk about or preach about because so many people have prejudices or misunderstandings about what the person of the Holy Spirit does. On one side, we have a group that says, we, we, we want to be only going by what the Word says. We just want to trust the Word. We, we want to avoid any emotionalism and fanatism and the, the people are talking about the Holy Spirit normally bring. And then on the other extreme, we have people, we have groups that have made the Holy Spirit such a spooky experience by their excesses that people are afraid of that. And Pastor Nathan was mentioning a few weeks ago, he making the Twilight Zone, uh, you know, sound like do 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 do. And sometimes we think that's what the Holy Spirit is, and it is far from the truth. It is not weird. It's not. Uh, it's not paranormal. It's. It's. Uh, but, but the peop- the problem is that some people have made it into a carnival type sideshow, and they have blamed it all on the Holy Spirit. And so say they use their emotionalism, their fanatism, and their excesses. To call it the work of the Spirit. And, and so because of that, people tend to ignore the power that the Spirit brings to our lives. We tend to ignore it altogether and put it in a category maybe that we don't want to talk about or, or touch too often. Uh, Mark Patterson, the, the, the author, says, If you ignore one-third of the Godhead, you are functioning at two-thirds spiritual capacity. If you ignore one-third of the Godhead, you are functioning at two-thirds spiritual capacity. And so when Jesus was talking about, he was teaching about the Holy Spirit in the book of John, he said that when the Holy Spirit comes, he isn't going to teach about himself. He is not going to draw attention to the work, the, the, to, to, the, to the Spirit, but he's going to bring attention to Jesus. The Holy Spirit is going to put the spotlight on Jesus. He's going to exalt the name of Christ. He's going to make the things of Christ real to the hearts of those who follow Jesus. And to understand a little bit more about the Holy Spirit, I think we probably go to the source in the Bible where Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. In John 16, verse 1 through 7, it says, All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. None of you asked me. Where are you going? Rather, you're filled with grief because I have said these things to you. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And so Pastor Nathan was talking about this a few weeks ago the, at the very beginning of this series. And he was talking about what does the word advocate mean. And it's the comforter, the encourager, the counselor. It comes from the word Greek, the Greek word the paraclete, which means that he is a, 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 a help in adversity. He is there when we need him the most. John 16, 12 through the 12, 14 says, I have much more to say to you. More than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. And one of the saddest things that we've experienced in the last 18 months was when we visited Mexico City... And we were touring the historical center, 
and we saw all of these beautiful cathedrals. We saw all of this amazing architecture that people built many, many centuries ago. And while many people were marveling at the beauty of the cathedrals that they had in the center, my heart was saddened because I would see that there was no true work of the Spirit that was happening within them. It, a lot of people marvel at the relics of these cathedrals uh, in, in their reminder of a time when God was alive in the heart of the men and the people that were working to make that a reality. And while people marvel at the architecture, I actually grieve for what once was. It makes me sad for what the Spirit was doing at one point. And somewhere along the way, the same spirit that brought life to them, that uh, did all of these things possible, left. He was ignored. He was grieved. Human activity may have continued, but in, in, some, in some cases it continued for centuries. But the real God, the real life of God's spirit was absent from the life of the people in these churches. But let me tell you that uh, there is no Christianity without the power of the Holy Spirit. Samuel Chadwick, a Methodist leader and college president in England who, who, who passed away in 1932, he said the Christian religion is hopeless without the Holy Ghost. So we see that in Scripture, we, God tells us that he, God sent Jesus, the Father sent Jesus, but Jesus sends the Holy Spirit. And the only experience that you and I can have of God, the only experience, the only way that we can apply Jesus' work in our life, the only way that we can understand the person of Christ today is through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Before he left, the disciples were worried about how they were going to carry on without him. Jesus said in John 16, 7, that is way better that he would go because then the Spirit would come. Imagine how that sounded to them. A lot of them have given up careers to follow Jesus. A lot of them gave up riches. A lot of them gave up their families. And now they're supposed to change this Messiah who's supposed to change the world. But now he's saying he's leaving them. It doesn't make any sense. Jesus had done the miraculous while he was walking on earth. But there was one thing that he couldn't do while he was present on planet earth. And that was something that only the power of the Holy Spirit could do in the lives of these people. Jesus could only teach from outside of their bodies. They could hear his voice. They could hear the, the power of his expression. They could hear the power of his words. But what he could never do was get inside of them where the real problems were. When he was all in the flesh here, he was an external influence on them. As a flesh, as flesh, he couldn't inhabit them. But if we're honest, deep down is where all of our real problems are. For you and I, the problem is within us. The famous poet of our times, she wrote, it's me. Hi, I'm the problem, it's me. And that's probably the only thing she got right there. Because Proverbs 4.23, it says, keep your heart with all diligence for out of its spring the issues of life. Jesus is saying, I've been with you, but when the Holy Spirit comes, he will be in you. I've been here with you, but when the Holy Spirit comes, he will inhabit you. In fact, the Bible describes Christian as, as a Christian as someone who believes in Christ to the point that they're born again, and now the Holy Spirit lives inside of them. Romans 8, 9, it says, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. So the Holy Spirit makes Jesus real to us. The Holy Spirit is God's only agent on earth and here is, here is what we can, on, here's the only reason why we can understand what the Bible is telling us. We can have power in our church. We can have power in our personal lives. Only through the encounter with the Holy Spirit, we can see genuine, cha genuine change in our lives with an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Everything we read in the Bible, in the New Testament, it centers around the power of the Holy Spirit in the early church. 
The church wasn't born when, when the disciples started following Jesus. That's not, that's not when it was born. The church was born when the Holy Spirit came down on them in the upper room in Acts 2. And that empowered them to do God's will on earth. Because when the Holy Spirit came and inhabited them, everything about them changed. One specific example that we can find about what does it look like when everything changes for them is for the Apostle Peter. The Apostle Peter was the type of guy that would be brash, that would not be careful with his own words. He would be the guy that would stick his foot in his mouth every time he would do something wrong. When they came in to apprehend Jesus, uh, the, the Gospel of John tells us that he was the one that cut the servant's ear with the sword. And so he was the one that, that was having this. And, and he was in that conversation when they were all arguing about, about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. He was, before he had an encounter with the Holy Spirit, he was jockeying for position. He was politicking. He was comparing. He was competing. He was posturing himself. He, he had a lot of potential, but he also had a lot of rough edges. What happened to Peter? Uh, Peter? Didn't he have a, a great teacher? Yeah, Jesus was his teacher. Didn't he, didn't he get fed with the word all the time by his, by his teacher? Of course, Jesus was his pastor. Did he not have the right model? Yeah, he had the right model. Jesus was his mentor. But with all of that, when the pressure was on, he denied Jesus. He said that he was not a part of the disciples. So what happened? to all the discipleship, to all the modeling, to all the mentoring that he had received. What happened with everything he had witnessed firsthand from Jesus? When the moment of truth came, what happened? Why didn't it work? Because no outward teaching can replace the inward work of the Holy Spirit. On the, yeah, amen. And so on the day of Pentecost, we see a totally radically changed Peter. He gets up, he preaches, he's a different man. He preaches a message that days earlier he had denied. The message that Jesus was the savior of the world. And if you follow him through the book of Acts, you see him doing amazing thing after amazing things. You see him grow in wisdom. You see him grow in the power of God. And, and when you reach church history, because this is not, this happened after all of these books were written, you find out that Jesus, the, the Peter, the coward that had denied Jesus at the crucifixion, later was willing to sacrifice his own life and died the same kind of uh, death that Jesus did. So the one that couldn't uh, accept that Jesus was the Lord came to the, to the realization and had a transformative life change experience that he was willing to give his life for what, what he once had denied. So what was the difference? What was the difference? Why was he now full of courage? Why was he now a different man? Because Peter confirmed what Jesus had said. It is better for you that I go so that the Holy Spirit can come. I have been with you, but the Holy Spirit will be in you. And so today I would like to invite you to reconsider the intimacy that we have available through the power of God, available through a walk with the Holy Spirit in our lives. I want you to know, I want you to walk with, I want you to be filled with the supernatural agent of God's presence on earth. And, and remember, the, the, the Bible tells us, Peter, uh, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it tells us the word, the temple of the Spirit. It says, do you not know that your bodies are temple of the Holy Spirit? And there is a correlation between indwelling, the presence, the temple that I would like to point out to you this morning. God's desire since the beginning, since he created the world, since he put Adam and Eve in Eden, was to desire to, 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 to dwell with his people. His desire was to be with us. And what happens is that we encounter with sin came into the world, it severed the relationship that we had with God. The rest of the Bible we find is a narrative of a faithful, good God going after exiled people with love, even when they are unfaithful to the promises that he had made them. Simply because he, he wants to be with them. He longs to dwell in them. There was no temple in the garden because God was there. 
Sin messes it up. And then we find out that the, the people of God create a temple and then create a, first it's a tabernacle, it's a tent in the desert. And then later on they, they build a temple so they can reestablish the presence of, of God among them. But even then only one person, one selected elite person could go into the holiest of holies and have an experience, the presence of God in his life. Only one person. And then when Jesus comes, he is the temple of God. He is indwelling, he is the presence of God on earth, when he walks on earth, God's presence is among men. John 1, 14 says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. When it says made his indwelling, it literally tra translates as God tabernacled among us. He literally pitched his temple, his, his, his tent, and moved in with us into our community. That's what it says. It says that the glorious presence that came on earth in the form of Jesus was here. He, his presence was here. He was the embodiment of his glory. Jesus was the temple. But now in 1 Corinthians, Paul is telling us we are the temple. There's a difference here. We are the temple. And what I find is that the word for temple used in the original language where he's describing that, it's, it's, it's not of the outer court of the temple. It's not of the, you could think of the lobby of the temple or the outside part of the temple or just at the temple as a general presence or as a building. But it was describing the inner court of the temple. It was describing the word the, the, where the place where the visible, tangible demonstration of the presence of God inhabited. The glory of God was in that inner court. And that's what Paul is referring to. We as Christians, we are inhabited by the Holy Spirit. This is what makes us different as people. This is what makes us different uh, than anybody else on the planet. Here's the thing though. For a lot of us, for a lot of people, Christianity is only about a cross. And it stops at forgiveness. There is no ongoing resurrection power that happens in our lives. There is no constant work of the Spirit working through us, through the Holy Spirit on a day-to-day -day basis. This is why so many de believers are defeated. They're weak. They're not walking in the victory that God has for them. People are being told about a cross, but few are connecting it to a supernatural life in the Holy Spirit for daily living. And when Jesus went to the cross and shed his blood, he took care of the past. Everything is gone, right? Everything about us is gone. Our sin is forgiven. He has promised to remember our sin no more. But here is the problem. Even when you take away all of my sin, even when the past is gone from my life, even if it's not remembered anymore, I am still left with a big problem for myself, which is me. The same one that got me into all the bad stuff, all the sin, is still here. What about today? What about tomorrow when the evil one comes and tempts you and tries to get you to do things that go against what the Bible says or, or the Lord says? How, how am I going to reproduce the life of Christ in my life? Can I do that in my own self-effort? I don't think so. You know how I know that? Because I've tried that doesn't work no one no one can do that not only does it not work it actually is guilt ridden slavery that is as bad as my previous sins because if there is nothing in me if left to myself nothing in me is there that is like Jesus unless the Holy Spirit comes and lives in me and produces Christ-like qualities in me I will never be able to manifest Jesus in my life without the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to come. This is why Jesus said, I have to go away. The Father sent the Son, and the Son sent the Spirit. And what is the work of the Spirit in our lives? He empowers us. He strengthens us against temptation. He teaches us how to pray. He makes the Word of God real to us in our lives. I don't know if you have ever read the word and, and have prayed that the spirit would reveal something to you and it speaks directly to your heart. That's what he does. We need something outside of ourselves that would make us more like Christ. 
in the new covenant, it isn't just about the cross so we can be forgiven about our past. But it is about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit so we can walk in victory in our daily lives today. How is God going to be glorified if we don't see lives change? And how, is, how are lives going to be changed without the power of the Holy Spirit making Jesus real in our church, in our personal lives, and in our communities? Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of of the earth. So walking in victory isn't just fleeing from sin. That's not what it is about. It's being proactive about being a witness of Jesus, being an instrument of his glory wherever you go because you carry the presence of God in your life. And so as we, as I was preparing for this message and we were selling our house, you know, we're, we're trying to sell our house. We, we had a garage sale kind of sort of thing yesterday in our house. And some friends came over that I didn't know had any uh, relation with, with harvest time. But as, as we started talking, uh, they, they gave me some, some, some great stories about the power of God through this church. In fact, uh, so our friends, her name is Jess and his, her husband is Marshall. And Jess, had, she grew up a nominal Christian in, in another part of, of, of Texas, grew up a nominal Christian and. When she went to college, she started attending Austin College to, to study psychology. And her junior year, that leads her to take an internship that moves her away and puts her in a host family who were real believers. She had never been in a home with real Christian believers in her, in, around her. So they started asking her questions about her life journey and how she came to know Christ and how long has she been, you know, a believer and how she got baptized. And then she realized that she hadn't been baptized since she was a, a little baby. So that summer she made the decision that she was going to get baptized. This was in the North Garland, North Dallas area. And then when she comes back for school that fall, she starts attending, attending Harvest Time. This was about 2006, 07. And she starts attending this church. And when she starts attending this church, she gets baptized in the Spirit. And after, after that experience, she says that she had one of the most amazing times. She was really happy that we were coming today to speak here because it had been a transformative time in her life to experience that power that she hadn't experienced before. And... Uh, it wasn't just about experiencing the Spirit because right after that season, her life took, uh, uh, started going into the professional world. And she became, uh, she, she started working for the psychiatric department for Dallas Children's Hospital. And when she was in that situation, she, was, she started to tell us she was entrusted in situations that she could only rely on the Holy Spirit to get her through those situations. There were cases of children that were going with, uh, with extreme mental illnesses and, and they were being, having all of these things. And she would just go in there every day and she would pray in her, in her prayer uh, language and under her breath while encountering all of these things. And she said, if I hadn't had a radical encounter with Jesus that summer and then been filled with the Holy Spirit, I don't know if I would be here today as a Christian. Maybe I'll be here as a person, fine. But I don't know if I would still be growing in my life and, and be closer to Jesus as I am right now. And so she's a testament of what the power of this Holy Spirit does when, she, when he comes and makes us not just feel good about ourselves or, or have a great moment of an, in an altar, but it starts impacting every situation that we walk into after we live, leave these four walls. She was able to win people for Christ, in, even in the middle of difficult situations, because she was able to rely in the power of the Holy Spirit in her life. People would come to her, ask her for prayer. She was not even supposed to give prayer because that's, you know, the, she signed a contract and she wasn't supposed to do that. Offer it just to people, but people would find her. She would go, do you pray? Yeah. Pray for me right now. I, I need prayer. We're going through difficult situations. And she was able to walk people through, the, through those situations because there was something different about her. It wasn't just Jess walking now through the halls of this hospital. It was the Holy Spirit inhabiting her, living inside of her, dwelling inside of her, who was able to give her power to get through the difficult times in her life. 
And so as we wrap up today, I want you to know that there is power available for you to be able to witness about the, the work of Jesus in our lives. The Holy Spirit enabled the apostles to fulfill an impossible task. He enabled them to fulfill what he was, what, he, what we call the Great Commission, to start, initiate it, which is taking the gospel to the ends of the world. And that power that we saw him given to them is available for us still today. It's available for you and I. But the power doesn't come without a purpose. The power doesn't come without a mission. The power doesn't come without a commission. It's an opportunity for us to collaborate with what God is already doing in spreading his gospel. It's an opportunity for us to tell others about the good news of Jesus. To tell the good news of Jesus to other nations, to other tribes, to other tongues. So what does it look like for you to live a life empowered by the Holy Spirit? I'll tell you what it looks like for us. For us, we are answering the call of the Holy Spirit of God to go and move to Mexico City and reach people that are far away from Jesus. But can I tell you something? You don't have to sell your house and move out of uh, the country, not even out of this uh, city, to start doing that in your own life. You can do that. That's available for you here in the city of Sherman. And so today, I just want to encourage you. I just want to leave you with this. If you have been baptized, if you have had an encounter with the Holy Spirit, let that change every single encounter that you have with people outside of these four walls. Let it change the way that you talk to your neighbors across the street. Maybe let it change the way that you go about um, spending your resources with people that are around you. Maybe, maybe the, what I, while I was talking, the Lord reminded you of that person in your life that maybe has gone without uh, food or maybe has gone without paycheck or maybe, maybe something happened to them recently. If the Lord has dropped that in you, that's the Holy Spirit talking to you. Why don't you, after this service, why don't you go and, and just text them, hey, hey, how are you doing? I just felt prompt to, to reach out. It doesn't have to be weird. You don't have to, you don't have to tell them the Holy Spirit said that. No, you just go and tell them, hey, I felt like reaching out to you and is everything okay? Is everything okay? Or maybe it's a family member that you haven't talked to in a long time and while, while you're hearing about other people being uh, courageous to go to the other side of the world, maybe you're feeling, okay, I, can this embolden me to be able to go across the table and talk to that family member that I haven't talked to in a long time? Maybe that's what he could do. It's as simple as that. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be this uh, life-altering, life like, nation. Like, you don't have to move countries to do it. You don't have to sell your possessions to do it. You don't have to, you don't have to do what we're doing, but... There's something that you can do. And so what's he empowering you to do today? I would like to extend an invitation for everybody to, to stand up this morning. And I would like to pray for you. And if through my thick accent you were able to get something this morning, I hope that it is that the Holy Spirit is available for you today so that you can reach out to people that are far away from him. Okay. So, Father, today we pray for every one of my brothers and sisters here, Lord. We thank you for the work that you're doing in this amazing community. We thank you for the work that you're doing in this amazing church that you have brought them to, Father. You've done radical changes in lives. We've seen people come from different uh, sin lives and different uh, paths that we wouldn't even dare to speak about today. But you've changed that for good, Lord. We've seen the goodness of God in their lives. Thank you for that. Father, I pray that we will be able to take all of those experiences and not just them be something that we can think about fondly about our past, but that it's an opportunity for us to extend that same kind of grace to somebody else. Lord, let your spirit work in us today, Lord. And it doesn't have to be any sort of... Uh, strange way that it happens it could just be a very simple breath it could just be a very simple name nudging in our hearts somebody's names comes up we'll call them lord we'll text them we'll reach out to them father i just pray that you will help us see that as opportunities to witness with your power to these people that are far away from god that are within our reach father i pray that you would give us the the alertness to see with our spiritual eyes what you see, Lord, to see, to sense with our with our bodies what you see, Lord, that you see all of these people that are lost 
and that are far away from you and you want a relationship with them just as you want it with us, Lord. We pray that your spirit will give us power, that it would, it would take us, Lord, to be courageous and do what only you can do, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen and amen. So this morning, I don't know if anybody, I know that we're, we're about to wrap up. So I don't want to take a lot of your time. But the Holy Spirit doesn't have to spend two hours here. He can do it in an instant. So I don't know if anybody would like to, would feel like this morning, that would like to receive prayer for the Holy Spirit to do something different in your life. Maybe you haven't been baptized in the Spirit. Maybe you want something uh, that you, you want to be more alert to those things. I don't know if anybody would say yes this morning, but I would like to pray for you. If anybody is, is willing to do that, and, and honestly, you don't even have to, you don't even have to, the front, you can do it from where you are. So with every, everybody, everybody, if you can help me, everybody can help me close your eyes and maybe bow your heads. And, and this is not a prayer to salvation, but maybe it's a prayer to, to ask anybody who would like to receive the Holy Spirit this morning, I would like to pray for you today. Would anybody say, I, I would love to do that this morning? Please reach your hands, uh, extend your hands this way. We're going to pray for the people that have that desire in their hearts. Lord, we pray for everybody here, Lord, that they would be, they would encounter the, your, your presence this morning, Lord, that they would encounter the Holy Spirit. We pray for the work that you're going to do through them, Lord. We thank you for what you're doing in their lives already because the nudging that they're experiencing, that's you. And, and I want you, Lord, to, to uh, I, I, I want them to understand, Lord, that just because it hasn't happened doesn't make them any different or they're not as, as uh, passionate believers. But, Lord, uh, there is something else that you have uh, given to us as believers, and we want to pray for that for them. So, Father, we pray. We extend our hands to them, to our brothers and sisters this morning. We pray for an abundance, Lord, of your spirit, a power of, that can change us in, in the name of Jesus, Lord, to be able to witness to people that are far away from you. So, Father, we pray for that spirit to come on every one of them to experience you in the name of Jesus. We thank you, God. Amen.